Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're talking about how to translate untranslatable words. But first, it's our Patreon anniversary! Yay! And we are super excited to revisit the topic that we visited for our first episode, which is swearing. Yay! Rude episode on Patreon. So our first Patreon episode was all about the sounds of swearing and swearing in different languages, and this time we're talking about the grammar of swearing, and we already have reports that it made somebody uh, laugh out loud in public, so maybe don't listen to it around young children (laughs) or uh, in public because you might have to explain to them why you're laughing so hard. So you can go check that out at patreon.com slash enthusiasm. We also, uh, conveniently for our anniversary, unlocked a new Patreon goal, which we are really excited about. This one is a goal to commission some Lingthusiasm-themed art. Yes, so we're very excited to have some exciting art and for you guys to get to see concept sketches and where things go from here. So stay tuned for more exciting Lingthusiasm art news. So, untranslatable words. Lauren, have you come across any untranslatable words lately? It's because I came across, like, three in the space of a day that I was like, we really have to talk about this topic because it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a linguist meme, or a talking about language meme is this idea that there are some words that just aren't translatable, or words for which we don't have, meanings for which we don't have a single word and maybe we should. So the first is a language log post from Mark Lieberman. He's talking about how there was a big, windy, wintry, weathery event in Philadelphia that meant that there were a lot of discarded umbrellas left around. And he talked about how there's no word for a dead umbrella. Isn't the word for a dead umbrella just dead umbrella or (laughs) broken umbrella? Well... I don't know why this has to be so hard. We can chat about it, but he felt like it was something that needed a word and a blog post. And the other one... Is it an (laughs) umbrella? Lauren. <laughs> An umbrella. <laughs> I need to write into Mark. Yeah, we've solved it. <laughs> you have your umbrellas and you have your umbrellas. Uh, and the, the second blog post about untranslatable words or no word in a language was from my favourite gynaecologist, Dr. Jennifer Gunter, who has a really fabulous blog. And she, <laughs> she was talking about... Uh, I'll just read the quote. I believe there is no word in any language to describe that unique experience of simultaneously running out of both pads or tampons and toilet paper when you're sitting on the toilet and in immediate need of both. This is a terrible situation, but I I think she's described it. I don't know. Like, (laughs) am I the untranslatable word skeptic here? (laughs) But I think she's, you know, you just put several words together and it did a pretty good job of describing this relatable experience. But there's no single word that encapsulates... I mean, there are plenty of single words, and most of them are more appropriate for a Patreon episode than this episode, (laughs) Uh, but none that specifically encapsulates that meaning. Yeah, I mean, so this is a thing that I've been thinking about in terms of uh, what I've called the schadenfreude effect, which is, you know when you learn the word schadenfreude and you're like, wow, the Germans, they really do have a word for everything. Like, taking pleasure in someone else's misfortune. It's not just me who's uniquely terrible at doing this sometimes. Like, (laughs) other people do this too. Whoa, mind blown. (laughs) And the thing that I think makes us resonate with these lists of untranslatable words or ideas that certain concepts are untranslatable or there should be a word for something is that, you know, words are a way of packaging our experiences. And if we have a word for something, then we know that someone else has thought of packaging that particular experience before. And so saying, oh, is there a word for this? is also kind of trying to reach for, haven't other people also had this common experience? Or isn't this something else that other people have also felt? I really like that you've coined the term schadenfreude effect to really encapsulate (laughs) the meaning of feeling pleased that you found a word that neatly translates a concept that you thought didn't have an elegant word for it. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's kind of when you encounter a word that describes something you're, you're already familiar with. 
Um, and I came up with it actually because there's this paper that I really like about people learning words and how best to teach people new concepts and new vocabulary. And so they did this study and I think it was a biology class or an economics class, I don't remember, an intro class at a university somewhere. And they had some of the students got a reading with kind of your standard textbook reading that is like, you know, mitosis is blah, blah, blah. And, you know, uh, supply and demand is blah, blah, blah. I don't remember whether this was biology or economics. So the biology <laughs> slash economics textbook. In the highly in demand intro bio econ course. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so they got your kind of standard reading that had like a bunch of terms with their definitions. And then the other people got a different reading, which was a version where you had all the concepts explained to you saying there is a concept in, you know, biology where cells divide, blah, 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 or in economics where <laughs> people buy things at different rates. And then for those students, they got to class and they got a brief list of vocabulary words that said these concepts that you were exposed to in the reading, here are the words for them. And then they did a post test on how well the students did in learning these concepts. And they found that the students that had been exposed to the concept before the jargon did better than the students that were exposed to the jargon and the concept at the same time or even the jargon first. So, so it's not just a matter of smashing words into your brain. Yeah. And it's, you know, when you, when you come across a word like schadenfreude and you're like, wow, this is so satisfying to learn this. The reason it's satisfying to learn the word schadenfreude is because you're already familiar with the feeling. Right. And it's less satisfying to learn a word like, I don't know, a mitosis or something because you're not familiar with this concept before you learn the word. So you're having to learn the word and the concept at the same time. I guess that's why, and this is going to date this podcast horrifically, uh, why Hugo has resonated so much with people in the last like 18 months. It's just been like a Hugo bonanza of like mm -hmm. Danish, Scandinavian, cozy, thoughtful, living books. Yeah, and it's all about this, like, okay, here's this concept that we'd like to be able to reach for, or this idea that we'd like to be able to articulate better. Like, doesn't everyone want more coziness in their lives? And, you know, it comes with a lot of kind of cultural stuff, but it's it's a it's around the idea of like people wanting more more coziness or more of whatever it is that thing that the Danes have. Um, I think this is the same reason why words like tsunzoku often show up on untranslatable words lists as well. So this is the Japanese word for the pile of books that you haven't gotten around to reading yet. What's wrong with my pile of unread books? Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people who talk about their TBR pile, which is their to be read pile, mm. or their reading list. And as far as I can tell, they're, I don't know, used pretty similarly <laughs> to Tsundoku. Um, but it's, we're familiar with the idea of, of course, you have this pile of books you haven't gotten around to reading yet. Yeah. And like, oh, isn't it convenient that there's a, there's a convenient package for this thing that you either are intimately familiar with or that you would like to be more familiar with, as in the case of Hugo. Interesting how sometimes these words will enter into English. So like schadenfreude, I think is, I mean, you can tell from my very Australianizing of it. Like it's it's a comfortable piece of my vocabulary. I can use it actively in a sentence and I feel really comfortable with it. But I like I think Hugo is kind of crossing into that at the moment. I don't I think it's too fatty personally. Yeah, I don't I think it may still be too much of a fad at the moment, but it may be crossing over. I heard someone saying Tsundoku like in a sentence in English, but she was someone who'd lived in Japan for a while, so you know, I don't think she was using it anglicized. So I don't know which ones of these are crossing over. Yeah. But one of the things that I always think about when I think about these lists of like, oh, here's a bunch of words that are untranslatable is first of all, well, here is this convenient column B where someone who just provided a bunch of nice translations for them. <laughs> so how untranslatable are they, really? And also that if you look at a language just through the lens of its lexicon, you can end up with some really weird conclusions. Yeah. And my favorite example of this is French doesn't have a word for please. Therefore, obviously, the French, they must be very impolite, maybe. But what they do have is a four-word phrase, s'il vous plaît, which comes in another form, which is s'il te plaît, which both mean effectively please. And in fact, they come in formal and informal versions, this phrase that means effectively please. And so, sure, if we look at the lexicon of French, the individual atomizable words with spaces in between them, like, oh, dang, there's no equivalent for please. Like, how do you even be polite in this language? But if we look at it even just one step further in subtlety, 
<laughs> of course there are lots of ways to be polite in this language. And so, you know, seeing a language just through the lens of its lexicon, on the one hand, it gives us some of these interesting packages, but on the other hand, it misses out on a whole lot of what a language actually is if all we're doing is looking at the lists of words and their translations. It reminds me of the there's no way to say yes and no in Mandarin mm -hmm. meme. You know, th there isn't just a convenient word like yes, we, see, that you can use to answer an affirmative and no equivalent of like no that you can just use to say no to a question that someone asks. And it's because you say, you know, if someone says, do you want this? You use the equivalent of want or don't want. Like, Oh, Gaelic does this too. Yeah. So just because you can't find yes or no in a simple word list doesn't mean you're unable to say it. You're like, whoa, you can't do negation yeah. or affirmative in these languages. Like, clearly the speakers are capable of agreeing and disagreeing with things. Yes and no are untranslatable. It's just like, oh, you know, they have some way of expressing affirmative and negative life is going on. Yeah. But something that interests me is the subtler domains where things are actually harder to translate as well. And one of the big areas for me for that is poetry, because what makes a poem essentially is that you have a relationship with form and meaning that is aesthetically pleasing. And contextually dependent. And different languages do have different relationships between form and meaning. So to take a very simple example, a pair of words that rhyme in English don't necessarily rhyme in another language you might be trying to translate a poem to. So if you have something like roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and I love you, the kind of classic four-line paradisable poem in English. All versions of that poem are said in deep, deep earnest, Gretchen. <laughs> it's the most moving piece of poetry. <laughs> so moving. <laughs> Why wasn't this our Valentine's Day episode? <laughs> um, so you have something like this, but blue and you rhyme in English, and they don't rhyme in many other languages. There's no particular reason why they have to rhyme. It's just they happen to in English, and so they make good subjects for poems, and that's why we don't say violets are purple, because purple doesn't rhyme with you. And so when you try to translate that into another language, either you've got to be unfaithful to the meaning and use a different pair of words that do rhyme, or you've got to be unfaithful to the rhyme and then not reproduce the aesthetic experience of getting the poem. And so because there's this inherent asymmetry, because, you know, different languages have different words, um, <laughs> shockingly, <laughs> it's really hard to translate things that rely on both the form and the meaning simultaneously. I remember learning to read Old English poetry, and I just couldn't get my head around it. involves alliteration. They weren't really mm. big into rhyming. And I was just like, I don't, I don't have a feeling for this being good. You know, my Old English teacher would just be like, this is such a great poem, you can feel the rhythm. And I'm just like, oh, but there's no rhyming. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's got to rhyme. Yeah, I, I remember don't know how to evaluate this. I tried to read uh, Hamlet in French once because, you know, whatever. How did that go? Well, what was really interesting for me is, you know, like the thing about Hamlet and Shakespeare in general is that Shakespeare's all an iambic pentameter, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have your, um, like, da da, you beat your I am with. Strong, weak, weak, strong. Yeah, even my mm hmm was an I name Big Pentameter. I was really impressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, and you have five of those per line. But in French, you can't do that because French doesn't have word level stress the way English does. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll, we'll probably do at some point a, a full stress episode. But in French, you just only ever stress the thing that's at the end of the whole sentence or phrase. That's it. That's all you do. That you have to do right. it that way. Okay. And so you can't yeah. divide a poem into you know beats like that because French doesn't do beats that way. And so what French poetry has instead that's like stylistically similar to iambic pentameter is something called the Alexandrine, which is twelve syllables per line. So iambic pentameter gives you ten syllables per line. The Alexandrine gives you twelve, which is pretty similar. And so this translation of Hamlet was all written in Alexandrines with the 12 syllables per line. So they get like an extra two syllables per line. The yeah. whole thing goes for like an extra 20% of time. But like it often takes more syllables to say the same thing in French anyway, because okay. French is kind of spacious like that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it kind of balanced out. But like, yeah, you just got this very different... And was it in modern French or ye olde French? I don't remember. I think it was in pretty modern French, though. It didn't feel super ye olde. Right. Um, but, like, I also don't necessarily know what ye olde French would sound like, you know? 
Fair enough. Because sometimes, like, translating across time, you know, we talk about translating between cultures and, you know, there's, I think, dare I say, a bit of fetishization of, like, Scandinavian and Japanese social life that mm -hmm. we overextend when we're kind of borrowing their words that translate interestingly. And we forget that, you know, translating from older texts, like translating from Shakespeare or going back further to something like Beowulf, there's actually a lot that's not easily translated between those. Yeah, and when you're translating something like, you know, Shakespeare's stuff was written in current English to the original audience he was writing to. He wasn't writing in fakey oldie English. And so do you try to be faithful to that for the modern reader, or do you try to reproduce the experience of the modern reader in experiencing that as something old? So something I've been really fascinated about recently has been the Emily Wilson translation of the Odyssey. Mm. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> um, I follow her on Twitter now. It's really great. Um, and so she is uh, heralded as the first woman to translate the Odyssey into English, uh, which is kind of shocking yeah. that we've gotten this far and it took that long. And I have to say, most of the versions that I have ever come across have been quite dusty, dry, like they feel like they were written at the time of Homer, even though they're in English. <laughs> well, not quite Homer, but like this kind of 1800s yeah. feel. And that's the thing, you see, like, even the ones that were written in like, I don't know, the 1950s often have this fake ye oldie thing, because like, oh, well, Homer is a classic, and so you need to make him sound oldie. So what's Emily Wilson done? And so Wilson doesn't do that. She's not doing ye oldie, and her first line that she translates the poem as is, uh, tell me about a complicated man, which is referring to Odysseus. God, that could be a text that I sent someone. That's an Avril Lavigne song. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Odysseus, why did you have to go make things so complicated? <laughs> Right now, I'm just unweaving this loom, and man, I really hate it. <laughs> uh, you know, like, this is, that's that's a very real translation. But she also, and this is something that the other translators also don't do, she also translates the, the whole, uh, you know, epic poem in verse, and she does all of her lines in iambic pentameter. Right. And the other translators tend to render it kind of in prose or in kind of like shortened lines, but without paying attention to that beat in the same sort of way. Yeah. And so I'm also really holding out for the audiobook version of this translation of the Odyssey because I want to hear it read. It was originally an oral piece of literature, and I really want to hear someone render it to me in that sort of way. Mm, that would be fun. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> it's, it's one of my post-book projects. I'm going to dive into that pretty deeply, I think. Awesome. Yeah, but so untranslatability, when it comes to things like, you know, how do you render? And I think the uh, I think the Greek word that she's trying to render with complicated is um, polytropos. I'm probably getting that wrong, but it means like many turning. Mm -hmm. Poly meaning many and tropos is like turning, like a heliotrope is a flower that turns towards the sun. Yeah. But many turned is not really a, an idiom in English. And so different translators try to render that idiom in different sorts of ways that both try to make it legible for the reader and also try to make it sound somewhat idiomatic and, you know, give you a sense of the feeling of the source text in a short amount of space. I mean, idioms are super difficult because they're often multiple words, or if it's just one word alluding to the whole idiom, like idioms already come as complicated sets of words that have a specific meaning that you can't just go like word plus word, you know, looking a gift horse in the mouth, you can't say look plus horse plus gift plus mouth equals... It's a nice Greek idiom, Lauren. Yeah. I was just keeping on theme. You have to, like, know about how gifts work and how horses work. And actually, I don't actually know how horses' mouths work. <laughs> I just know that, you know, you want to make sure they're healthy, and that's apparently the mouth. Yeah, I remember I was reading a book that I, you know, when I was practicing French, I was I, I was reading stuff in French that I'd already read in English. Yeah. And the English passage of this book had said something like, something, something, something was carrying coal to Newcastle which I've never been to Newcastle, but I know that this is an idiom for, you know, Newcastle is a big producer of coal, and so why would you bring coal to Newcastle? Newcastle already has the coals. Yeah, was it taking croissants to Paris? <laughs> I wish it was. They just said something like it was just a drop of water in the ocean. Taking mustard to Dijon. <laughs> I don't think those are idioms in French the same way that coal to Newcastle is an idiom in English, right? So that would be kind of 
bringing you out by saying, oh, what what is this weird idiom that they have? So instead they had just is a drop of water in the ocean, which, you know, is kind of idiomatic, but is also something that you can interpret at a very literal level, and it doesn't uh, particularly require context for the idiom. Yeah. Because um, also the book wasn't supposed to be set in France, so it'd be weird to have a very Frenchy idiom. Uh-huh. So we can have this kind of translatability complication over time in English, but we could also have it over space because English is a language that is spoken in many places and many places have their own words that have their own specific meaning. Yeah, I really like adding to those untranslatable lists of like, you know, here's this very specific meaning that this Japanese pile of books brings to you. English has a specific verb for to deceive someone into watching a video of Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give It Up. Hey, wait, we we do. What does it say about the English speakers <laughs> that we have the verb to rickroll? Oh my gosh, it's such a profound reflection on what it means to be an English speaker on the internet that we have created the word rickroll. I know, right? I've never thought about it like that before. It's really fun to flip this trope around. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, the English speakers, like, it's going to be on a French word list somewhere and be like, look at those English speakers, look what they've done. <laughs> Oh, that one's going to date really badly as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, Rick Roll's a classic. <laughs> and there's different words in Canadian English and Australian English that sometimes have different connotations. And since we bump into this occasionally, I thought we would do like a mini, mini quiz round. Okay. Are you going to quiz me? I'm going to quiz you. I have some words here that have very specific meanings in Australian English. Mm -hmm. And I want you to have a go at what you think they mean. Okay. The first word is bogan. Uh, I'm familiar with bogan, but I don't know if I could actually define it. Is it like, is it kind of like a hick, but in Australia? <laughs> or like a chav, but in Australia? <laughs> I like that you're like going for definition by triangulation. Yeah. <laughs> Like, it's it's kind of more, like, working-class salt of the earth, but also the, like, people that politicians kind of try to make up to. Yeah, that's... Actually, you did pretty good there. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, like, you can identify them from the particular sports that they're interested in, kind of, you know, like the footy, like the cricket, something, something outdoors, something, something wearing flannel. Um, <laughs> okay kind of the set of meaning that goes together to define... I mean, in, in Canada they like the hockey, so I, I think I, I may somewhat understand this this demographic. Yeah. The next word is mateship. So, because like I know that you say, people say mate in Australian English to be like, good day, mate. Or like, what are you doing, mate? That was a bad idea. So mateship is like the quality of having mates or like the relationship that you have with your mates or this kind of thing? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that is great. You've just kind of said the meaning of both of those words at the same time. Good start. <laughs> <laughs> is there something else I should be adding? It's something to do with the ineffable quality of reciprocal support. It's tied in a lot with the idea of community. Not gonna lie, it has a kind of Anglo vibe. It's, oh my god, it's Australian hugo. It's Australian political dog whistling <laughs> to like, oh, you know, the way things should be. I back in the like, when Australia was quite Anglo, it never really was, but that's another point. Or, or this kind of idea of Australia's as like, battlers forged through hardship and adversity and are now somehow all kind of closely knit for that. This is my kind of definition of mateship. Okay. Yeah, I definitely don't have the political context there. <laughs> it doesn't, like, stir your soul. That's what it's meant to, like, evoke this. It just ships my mates, mate. <laughs> <laughs> the final one is early mark. I, I like, have no idea. Have a guess. Just make up. A, like something that, like, you, when you're, like, on your market set go, so it's, like, the early first thing you do? Mm, no. <laughs> I told you I didn't know. This one 
is not even like so this is not a word that I have in my active vocabulary. Okay. And it shows that like even in a country like Australia which has a really quite homogenous use of language across Australia given how big it is. This is from kind of New South Wales and Queensland. Okay. And it's an early mark means you get to leave school or work early. Oh. I have no idea why. New South Wales never really explain it to me. I have a word for that, but I don't remember what it is. Is it leaving work early? Yeah. Okay. Um. No, no, there's like an idiom to it. And if I, I'm, I'm sure my like high school self is reaching through time and being like, how did you forget this? It was very important to you. Yeah, it was really important to me <laughs> for 13 years. And now I can't remember. I'm familiar with the concept, but not the, not the term. Well, there you, you have, a, that's an untranslatable word for you, Gretchen. It's a concept you're very familiar with and you've never no, had. No, it's a, it's a Schadenfreude thing. <laughs> it's the Schadenfreude effect I'm familiar with from the English to English. Okay, can I give you a Canadian one? Sure. So, are you familiar with the Canadianism Took? I am, but I feel like I'm not going to know where to draw the boundary on it. Okay, well, try. So, I know it's a hat. Uh-huh. Um, yay for having Canadian relos. <laughs> I um, mean, relatives for the non-Australians. <laughs> th- thanks for translating for me. Um, Welcome. <laughs> it's a hat, but it's like a hat you wear in the cold. Like... Mm-hmm. I'm going to translate it into my English and say it's a beanie, which is like a knitted or like thick woolen hat that doesn't have a brim or anything. It's just like an egg warmer for your head. Yeah, Americans do call it beanie, so I wasn't sure if you'd have beanie as a term because it's like kind of warm to wear beanies in Australia. So yeah, people call it a beanie. I have a beanie as something like very different. <laughs> What's a beanie then for you? A beanie is one of those like like round caps that has like a spinny thing on top. That they wore in, like, the Whoa, 20s or something? Oh, no. Gee. That's so confusing. <laughs> How do we even talk to each other? Sometimes it's a complete <laughs> mystery to me. I know. It's going to be very difficult if I ever come and visit you in the cold. Don't come here with a beanie. <laughs> you need to bring a toque. I may own a few toques, but I do not own any hats with little spinny things on top, <laughs> and I do not aspire to. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> So even when we speak the same language, we still kind of reach these moments of translation where we have to hopefully figure out that we're not talking about the same beanie. Yeah. I don't know. Personally, I think that my favorite really difficult word in English to translate is the. (laughs) That's not going to look nice on any list, Scratchin. But it's so difficult because, you know, some languages don't have articles like the and uh and an at all. You know, like, Russian doesn't have them, Chinese doesn't have them, I don't think. And, like, there's a whole bunch of languages that don't have this at all. And so trying to translate into those languages is really hard. And for speakers of those languages, trying to learn English and being like, should I be using the the? But how do you know? (laughs) And then there's a bunch of languages that have, like, several of them. Yeah. And then even languages which have what is ostensibly still a definite article don't use them in the same sorts of ways. Yeah. So... In English, if I want to say, like, I go for a walk on Mondays, I don't put the the on Monday. But in French, if I want to say, I go for a walk on Mondays, then I have to say le lundi, not just lundi. Go for a walk on the Monday. Go for a walk the Monday, singular. Okay, the Monday. Yeah, so it's like, even in languages that ostensibly have things that map to this category, figuring out how to use them slightly differently depending on the language is a rich and difficult area of uh, of investigation. <laughs> so, we've established that it's not untranslatability. It's unable to translate into, like, a single convenient word. And it's not untranslatability because, like, it happens across Englishes too. Mm-hmm. So what is happening here? I think it's it's about there's kind of there's two kinds of meaning that come with a word. Mm-hmm. There's the kind of, you know, one sentence easy to describe dictionary sort of meaning. Yep, which is what we often think of as meaning. Yeah. And then there's all of the kind of surrounding context, the social context and when you learned a word and what it means to you and this kinds of things. You know, I was coming across uh in one of these lists a uh, word about, I think it was a Swedish type of coffee break. And they say, Fika. Fika. That's a good one. And they were saying, well, in the Swedish coffee break, you're not allowed to talk about work, and you must only talk about things that are not related to work. And uh-huh. I don't necessarily think that this is an intrinsic property of Fika. 
as Fika specifically. I think this is a Swedish yeah. property of coffee breaks. You know, right. like I know what a coffee break so is. Conflating the like coffee break and the oh, I always think because like with Fika, it's about like having coffee and fruit. I think of it as like let's do coffee. You know, the mm. like the act of doing coffee. Yeah, that's what I think of Fika as. Let's let's get, let's get coffee or let's let's do coffee, yeah. not just like you're sitting by yourself at your desk having sad desk coffee. That is definitely not Fika. I know that, and I'm not Swedish. <laughs> um, but like you know, the the cultural things of like what you do at a coffee break, or you know, if you talk about different, I don't know, to go back to the school example, different recess traditions or different school break traditions. Like, do you go out and play in the playground, or do you stay inside because it's very cold in Canada in the winter time sometimes, and they wouldn't <laughs> let us inside, <laughs> even with our toques. So now that we have the concepts of these two forms of meaning. Do you want the jargon? Yes, I like the jargon. Okay, so the like specific to the point meaning, dictionary meaning, more or less, is denotation, which I always remember because like denotation and dictionary start with mm. the same letter. Um, and then connotation is all the context to the meaning. Do you see what ah, I did there? Good. Um, so I'm going to explain denotation and connotation using sandwiches. Okay. Um, and of course, we pulled sandwiches apart, not literally, just semantically in a Patreon episode. But I want to come back to sandwiches and talk about a historical anecdote in my family that kind of explains where denotation and connotation are in tension. So as I've mentioned, my grandmother is an English second language speaker. Mm -hmm. um, I've mentioned it on the show before. She's a Polish and German native speaker came to Australia, had to learn not only English, but also raising like a family of very Anglo educated children. So mm -hmm. my grandfather's English, they went to school in English and they wanted to kind of fit in with the other kids. And so the denotation of a sandwich is very simple. It's two pieces of bread with filling between it. Yeah. And my grandmother would send my mom and her siblings to school with sandwiches. But when my grandmother fell down was on the connotation of a sandwich because my grandmother took the two pieces of bread with some kind of tasty filling um, quite liberally. <laughs> and uh -oh. there are stories of her sending my mom to school with butter and peanuts because she couldn't <laughs> quite get the hang that like peanut butter was a specific thing. Oh no! Um, or sending them to school with, and I've, I've never tried this personally, um, but like chocolate biscuits in, in bread. Uh, that's very interesting. <laughs> and so this is like completely violating the idea of what a sandwich, what its connotations is. But she's still meeting the denotation of it. Yeah, I mean, I think in our sandwich episode, like, she's she's passing the sandwich test with flying colours. <laughs> she's doing better than a burrito. Yeah. Or a pierogi. Yeah, or a pizza or whatever. Like, she's she's got the, the two pieces of bread, which is pretty key, and you could make a chocolate chip cookie sandwich. Yeah. And so when we have these ideas of untranslatable words, we're trying to pull all the connotation along with the denotation. I mean, sometimes it's just denotation. Yeah. And the denotation that it has cuts the world in a particular way our language doesn't, and that would be nice to have. But often we're trying to drag a lot of the connotation along as well. And I think that's why Hugo feels like such a complicated thing to bring into English, because we could just say it means coziness, and we've kind of hit the denotation pretty well. Yeah. But we want to bring all of the Scandinavian knitwear, like candles, prettiness in along with it. Yeah, and it's it's kind of aspirational. Like this is this is how it could be. There's a quote from Dinosaur Comics that I really like that expresses this. You know, so they're talking about meanings of words and what's the what's the opposite of various things and T-Rex is getting more and more frustrated and says, "Language is hard." And the other character says, "No, life is hard. Language is just how we talk about it." <laughs> oh, that's so true. And it does these connotations make it really hard. They make it hard, especially for machine translation, because machines can't weigh up all the different connotations of different words in a way that a translator can. And that's part of the skill of translation is knowing what words to use that have the same connotations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're translating a scene about someone at a market, then, you know, the word cheap as opposed to inexpensive um, you know, something that's cheap has this 
connotation of inferior quality compared to using the word inexpensive. Yeah, or a good deal, you know? It could be the same thing, like a bargain. Oh, yeah, suddenly that's not only, like, it's, like, good like, cheap. Wow, that's good cheap. And, you know, or bad cheap or inexpensive. Like, there's all these different levels there. And But words are connotation magnets. I mean, it's why we need euphemisms all the time, because as soon as we start using a word in a particular context, it just amasses all these connotations and they become either pejorative and negative and that's how slurs kind of get cycled through which is not great or they kind of make all these other cultural inferences yeah and i think that one of the things that talking about words as untranslatable even though you know it can be satisfying to say oh wow here's these new concepts or here's here's this thing that i hadn't thought about in this way before in some respect every word is untranslatable and yet we managed to learn them all anyway yeah how do we learn any new word if no word has an exact equivalent somewhere. Well, you know, we we live a life and we figure it out. <laughs> and, you know, and in many cases, the, the word side of translation is very easy. It's the grammar side and the aesthetic side that's a lot harder. And all those connotations. I know when I learned Nepali, I had to keep track of three different formality levels, which, like, I know how to be polite to different people to different extents in English, but suddenly I had to do it in another language and in the grammar. And I remember just knowing who to use which level of formality with was a whole set of translation that I took a long time to really feel comfortable with. So I would definitely agree that the kind of grammatical encoding of things adds a, a translation complication that can be quite hard to master. Yeah, and yet you don't see, you know, different forms of you in difficult to translate lists, even though maybe they should be there. <laughs> We're going to start our own very exciting list. Um. <laughs> Let's make it difficult to translate for linguist lists. I I'm down for this. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. And I can be found as at Gretchen Amixi on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistic questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include the semantics of sandwiches, language games, how to teach yourself linguistics, and a double feature, two episodes about swearing. And you can help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts and recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire, our editorial producer is Emily, and our production assistant is Celine. Our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! <laughs> <laughs>